<laughs> okay, so I can't claim credit for this great slide. Uh, my colleague and collaborator, Jerry McDonough, created it. Um, but this is, um, I'm going to be talking, this is a case study. I'm going to be talking about the Preserving Virtual Worlds project, um, PVW1, as we call it was funded from 2008 to 2010 by the Library of Congress. And I'll touch just a little bit on our sister project, the follow-up project, PVW2, which is currently underway. Uh, Jerry McDonough is our fearless leader at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign, but this is a multi-institutional project. Project partners are University of Maryland, uh, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, and Stanford University, in addition to Illinois. So for this project, we adopted a case set approach. It was a very exploratory project. We were interested in kind of scoping the problem of what it even means to say you're preserving these complex uh, digital artifacts, um, software, complex software. And so the games in our case set, there were eight in all, spanned the years from 1962 to 2003 or thereabouts. Uh, we included a range of genres, um, a lot of interactive fiction. So we had, in our case set, um, uh, Colossal Cave Adventure, which is the first documented text adventure game. Um, we had uh, Space War, which dates from 1962 and was originally played on a PDP-1 machine. Um, as far as I know, the only functional PDP-1 machine is at the Computer History Museum uh, over in either, is it Palo Alto or San Francisco? Um, I don't know of any others. The case set also included first person shooter game, Doom. Um, other works of interactive fiction included Mystery House, which was the first work of, work of interactive fiction to include graphics. And you can see how incredibly crude, the, it's, it's actually, Mystery House is that house that you see in the upper, I guess it's your left hand corner of the screen. And the, the, it was filled with almost sort of stick-like figures. They were vector graphics. Um, I believe that Mystery House was coded in Fortran originally. Um, so, and then Mind Wheel, which another work of interactive fiction that was authored by uh, Robert Pinsky, former poet laureate of the United States. So I'm giving you just some background on the projects first, an overview of sort of what we did. And then I'm going to um, touch on issues of authenticity and trust in the open archival information system. Um, our project was OAS, OAIS compliant, as they say, so I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, and as I mentioned in the, when we had the, the sort of round table earlier, um, I adopt a very broad and expansive notion of data. Um, so uh, again, artifacts, phenomena, as the, was the term used during the discussion, um, events, actions, uh, ideas, um, as well as things like numbers. So you, can all, you all can let me know at the end if what I'm talking about is actually data modeling um, or if it's something else. And also for the archivists in the room, um, uh, if, I, if I get anything wrong about the OAIS system, please just correct me. So I mentioned that PVW was a, an exploratory project. Some of the problems that we encounter, the challenges while trying to preserve the games in our case set. And by preserve, we actually ingested the, the bits into institutional repositories at Stanford University and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, and, and, uh, and created information, information packages. Those are what live now in those repositories. Um, but things we, challenges we encountered were things like platform obsolescence, and you actually see the PDB, PDP-1 machine that I just referenced a minute ago there. Um, the, the technologies are simply, um, you know, have entered the, the stage of oblivion. Um, things like software dependencies, so when you run, uh, you know, a game like um, Mind Wheel on your computer, it's, it's hard to determine what the boundaries of the object are that you're preserving because there's so many software dependencies. So um, the, the, the computer program that is MindWheel will depend on the code li libraries supplied by the operating system that are shared across different programs. So that presents an enormous obstacle. Um, things like intellectual property law, 
Uh, this was huge in the case of, for example, Second Life. Second Life was in our case set, um, the only 3D virtual world in our case set, which dates from 2003. Um, oh, there it goes. <laughs> see the Twitter thing going up. Um, so, um, so, so Second Life, if you might know, if you've ever been in Second Life, that, um, that residents of the world uh, have, can claim intellectual property on the artifacts they create. So we weren't trying to save all of Second Life. That would have been a, you know, a fool's errand. Um, but instead, we were trying to try to, uh, to, to, to grab about three or four different islands in Second Life. So Democracy Island, Stanford University Library's presence in Second Life, um, the International Space Flight Museum in Second Life, and a few others. What we tried to do to, um, to address the IP issues was first uh, take an inventory of all of the different objects on a given island and then identify the in-world owners of those objects and essentially give them a virtual you know, gift of deed or donor agreement form um, to see if they would be ready, uh, willing to sign it to allow us to, to grab their content. Um, this failed miserably. Uh, the best case scenario was one of the islands, I think we got, got a 10% response rate, and on one or two of them we got you know, no responses at all. So, and there were enormous technical problems on top of that. Um, it's very hard, you can, it's, it's not that hard to get, um, to grab textures and basic uh, geometry information. There's actually a program called Copybot, which we use, which was created by Second Life griefers who were stealing people's intellectual property. So we rode on the coattails of the pirates and used their program for our preservation project, which is actually very typical. Um, in fact, one kind of sub-theme here is that everything we do in the realm of, in the realm of digital preservation of video games is, in, uh, is really parasitic, I think, on what the gamers do. Um, they, do they, they do extraordinary things. They build emulators. So very often in the library and information science world, we depend on the emulators created by gamers. They create weird hardware um, to do things like uh, grab, um, grab content off of obsolete storage media, magnetic media. Um, so the, there's one piece called a cryoflux, a piece of hardware. It's basically um, a floppy disk controller that allows you to circumvent the original platform or system that's now you know, very hard to come by and, and usually not in functioning order. Um, you, know, like you, you don't have to actually go track down an Apple II or a Commodore 64, whatever it is. You can simply use this cryoflux that's hooked up to um, a floppy drive, which you can still find, and it, and it doesn't, again, have to be a floppy drive from the original system and then it's connected with a USB cable to a modern PC. Um, the software on the hardware device um, isn't stymied by DRM. Um, it can basically read any format. Um, and so you, you, you just you grab the bits off of the magnetic media and then it's on your, it's, then it's on your modern PC. So they do things like that. Um, they create metadata. Um, and they are very cavalier about IP issues. Um, and one of the interesting things is that they make headway in getting IP um, rights uh, where, we, where we often fail. So for example, um, there's a lot of gamers who create what's, what's called machinima, which is movies made using game engines. Um, and they, um, this is con considered derivative work, and therefore, technically, you have to get the permission of the copyright holders. They started doing it anyway, um, not asking permission from the game developers. The game developers saw that it boosted their brand value, and they eventually created content usage rules that now give the pirates the, you know, the rights to actually create this work. So the practice of unlawful machinima led directly to the practice of lawful machinima. Um, we experimented with um, different forms of preservation, including um, migration, emulation, and what we sometimes call reenactment. It all goes by other names like recreation and reimplementation. Um, so I won't I won't say too much about this, other than um, uh, maybe I'll just say about emulation. Uh, well, a couple words. Um, so emulation. I think we tend to think of emulation as the equivalent of a kind of facsimile of the original object. And one of the things we did is that with our game set, we tested different emulators. So we would run um, our legacy software in different emulators and compare them. And they actually vary considerably. 
emulator to emulator and how, in the sort of the quality of their rendering. So some emulators might render color better or sound better or what have you. So there's actually a vast degree of difference across different emulators. Um, Reenactment or reimplementation. In our case set, we looked at uh, Mystery House, which I mentioned a minute ago, um, which was uh, released into the public domain in 1987, um, but the source code was never released. So in 2004, Nick Monfort, Emily Short, and some others um, recoded or re-implemented Mystery House in the Inform programming language, and it's available as the Mystery House Taken Over project online now. I'm just going to mention briefly um, PVW2. I'm, I'm not going to concentrate very much on it. This is our follow-on project. Our case set, I think there's a sm slightly smaller set of games, I think six, maybe seven. They're mostly educational games. Um, but it's hard to make a case that Doom, Doom, so Doom makes a reappearance in this case set. You can't really make a case that Doom is, a, is an educational game. But we've got Oregon Trail in there, um, Carmen San Diego, uh, Typing of the Dead, which was a game based on a previous ar arcade game, uh, a light gun shooter, a shooter on rails, uh, where you would kill zombies. And Typing of the Dead, um, the, uh, the player characters, um, now walk around with dream, portable Dreamcast machines strapped on their backs and keyboards. And instead, of, instead of shooting zombies, they type them to death. So this was seen as a typing game. So the zombies would get words over their heads, and you'd have to type them as fast and as accurately as you could to, to kill or neutralize the zombies. Um, so this project, the first project was really much, much more practical. As I said, at the end of the day, we were trying to ingest bits into repositories. This is really, in some ways, a more research-oriented project. Our premise is that um, preservation tends to be lossy. You tend to lose information over time. But if you can identify the most significant characteristics of the objects in your custody, then, then you can try to adopt preservation strategies to ensure that those features or characteristics remain intact, even if you lose others. Um, so in Typing of the Dead, for example, um, you know, it, you've really got to, uh, you've really got to preserve the fact that, it's, that it requires a QWERTY keyboard. It doesn't make any sense at all without that. On the other hand, maybe something like um, color depth or, or color tonality is, more of a, is, is a less important feature, so that kind of thing. What the big challenge with this project, there's a number of big challenges with this project, but one that's emerged, I think, um, uh, that looms rather large is that uh, the archival literature on significant properties and there is a fairly robust literature on this, um, usually define significant properties in a way that suggests their surface features. They, it's often described as the look and feel of the object that you're preserving. So, so features are attributes that you can visually inspect. And in the case of games, you're also interested in the underlying you know, data structures and structural properties. And that's very hard to get at because usually we don't have, we don't always have the source code. And we, we in fact, usually don't have the source code. Although for our case set, for some of the games, we did have the source code. Um, and besides that, it's not only about having the source code, it's about understanding the relationship between the underlying game engine and um, the, the expression of the work at the, vis at the visible level. So um, it's, it's something we've been thinking a lot about. Um, we're interested, for example, in, um, things like you know deep 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 pro, uh, sorry programming debugging tools um, that often you know that, that uh, programmers use to let them understand the relationship between the underlying code and the behavior of the the program. So when you see something buggy happening in a software program, how do you trace it back to what's happening in the code? And I'm not a programmer, but but they have these kind, kinds of tools. Um, also, I think you could look at something like. Um, what the, uh, the, the genomic community is doing. So they have a sort of similar problem where they, they have the genomic layer of data, the sequences of, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the genetic sequence, and then there are, there's also the, that's the genotypic layer, then there's also the phenotypic layer, which is the expression of those genetic sequences at the visual level, the behavioral level. And so they're very interested in trying to map between those two levels, and they've developed all kinds of tools for doing that. Um, and then there's a strong tradition in HCI, 
um, that is about trying to make under, the underlying behavior of systems visible to an end user. Um, I think we could learn a lot about this, and I think this ties it back into um, some of the discussion earlier today um, where Wendell was talking about, you know, what features of the underlying data model can we, um, you know, can we shield from the end user because it's simply not necessary for them to know. They might not be interested in knowing it. But the converse of that is that often it can help the end user to actually know something about the underlying data model um, or the game engine or whatever it is. And so again, in, eight, in the HCI field, there's, there's some really interesting work that tries to do that. So making like the behavior of a home network system understandable to the end user. Um, I just saw a fascinating talk about this um, at the iSchool University of Maryland the other week um, where the researcher um, was um, trying to help uh, users see what um, applications consume the most bandwidth, for instance. Um, was it, you know, YouTube or Facebook applications? And then they could also see which members in their household consumed the most bandwidth and other properties of the underlying system. So I, I think it's, I, I would point to this particular issue. Um, what we, what making, uh, uh, making the unseen seen um, as one maybe important aspect of data modeling. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to authenticity um, and trust. So basically, I, I suggested earlier that gamers play an incredibly important role in digital preservation. On the other hand, you, and then you've also got uh, professional archivists and researchers like myself who are trying to save games. And so I'm interested in kind of comparing and contrasting the two models of authenticity that exist in these two communities. They're very different. Um, and I think because the gamers play such a crucial role, there's no reason why both camps can't be, you know, pursuing um, their separate projects and adopting different models of authenticity. But I also think um, kind of uh, building on some of Jeremy John's recommendations around personal digital archiving, that we need to think about a kind of post, supporting a post-custodial model of game preservation where um, these player archivists take primary custom custody uh, we don't take, you know, we don't actually um, acquire um, all of these games ourselves, uh, but we try to provide services that let them do what they do better. How can we help this community? How can we partner with them? Um, and so understanding how their models of authenticity differ from ours can be useful in that regard. So I have up here the definition of, um, of authenticity that comes from the um, Society of American Archivists glossary of archival and record terminology. And um, so they define it as the quality of being genuine, not a counterfeit, and free from tampering, and is typically inferred from internal and external evidence, including its physical characteristics, structure, content, and context. And I kind of bolded the and free from tampering there, because I think that the OAIS model um, really builds on that facet of authenticity. Gamers, um, by contrast, adopt a, they're, I, they're, they're more sort of um, tolerant of variability. Um, so I'll get to that in just a minute. In fact, here's a couple of quotations. So the first quotation comes from John Ippolito, who is, um, who, who is an artist and also works on preserving uh, net art, um, uh, variable media art, as he calls it. And he has this to say about, that gets at some of these questions. New media art can survive only by multiplying and mutating. Fixity is death. And Alan had, a, you know, mentioned actually fixity um, around the planet's data model in his talk. So this is a very, very different model of authenticity that John Ippolito is identifying. There was also a fascinating talk on digital preservation and evolutionary theory at the 2010 Digital Humanities Conference at, at King's College London. Um, where the, uh, the authors were looking at the application of evolutionary theory to digital preservation. And among other things, they noted that um, this is Peter Dorn and Dirk uh, Ward, the ecology of longevity, the relevance of evolutionary theory for digital preservation. Keeping digital objects fixed and rigid is difficult, they say, yes. Migration as a preservation strategy, adapting data to the environment, which is what migration is, is better from a biological perspective. The traditional method of preserving first, then reusing content is illogical and even perverse from an evolutionary perspective. 
Evolution gets rid of unused functions. Better strategy is reuse than, than preserve. And copies should be free to evolve, make copies in evolvable forms. So I see actually what they're advocating as consistent with a lot of what the gamers do. Now, the gamers are not a homogenous community. And there are some, some um, remarkable differences of opinion. For example, the folks behind the Software Preservation Society, they're all gamers. And they're actually the ones who created the Cryoflux, which I mentioned earlier. earlier. They have what I'd almost call a kind of um, fundamentalist attitude toward digital preservation. And they've actually created tools that let them read um, flux transitions in magnetic, magnetic media at very, very, very fine resolutions. And so they are all about extreme fidelity to the bitstream. So that's um, you know, a sort of corner of the community that thinks very differently. Um, I'm going to skip the, the stuff. Uh, okay, so, I, meant, so the, I mentioned the open archival information system and their model of authenticity. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, I, first of all, it's, it's going to be hard to kind of condense the OIAS in, in a, one or two slides. Um, and, it, and it's always, whenever I see presentations on it, it's always incredibly tedious. Um, but this is, what it, this is my understanding of the OIAS um, uh, uh, model. So it's... It is a framework, a widely accepted framework, um, developed by the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems back in 2002. I think it was when it was finally published. Um, but it's meant to be kind of content agnostic. So the fact that it originated with this community doesn't mean it, ha it isn't used by other communities. On the contrary, it's very, very widely adopted in the archival world. Um, so the, the framework, uh, provides um, a, a sort of shared terminology and shared set of concepts um, for thinking about things associated with digital preservation. It basically um, spells out the different high-level functions and services um, that, uh, that a digital archiving system um, is responsible for, and it characterizes some of the attributes of the information objects that are the focus of preservation in the system. Um, so uh, this is, you always see this in the slides, um, it's not a implementation, it's not a blueprint for system design, it doesn't tell you anything directly about implementation of the system, um, it's again a very abstract model. This is a diagram you often see of the OAS um, that spells out the different stakeholders. So um, on one side you see the producers who are the creators of the digital information that a repository is um, acquiring and ingesting. You've got the consumer, which is called generally a designated user community in OAIS terms. So before you undertake um, the project of um, ingesting your bits um, and figuring out what it is you're going to ingest or collect, um, you do an assessment of the designated user community. You decide who that is, and you assess their knowledge base, as they say, and you try to provide information or save information um, that, um, that is consistent with your understanding of their knowledge base. So generally, the broader you go with your user community, if you, if you say the, the general public is your designated user community, you're going to have to supply more information as part of your OAIS information package than you would otherwise. Uh, because you have to assume um, you know, you're really kind of uh, preserving um, to, the, to the lowest common denominator in that case. Um, and I'm going to be really focusing in on that, on that middle square in the diagram, the archival storage. And here we see just another version of that same diagram, but here we've added the information packages that move their way through the, OI, the OAIS, the, um, the digital archiving system. Um, this is, they have lovely terminology for this. There are three variants or flavors of the information package, the submission information package, the archival information package, and the dissemination information package. The AIP, or I think they call it APE, is that right? Um, is, is, uh, is what's um, preserved and maintained as part of the archival storage function of the OAIS. So that's the focus of the preservation efforts, is that APE, that archival information package. And here you see a model of what's in that package, so the structure of the information. Um, it includes uh, content information, 
um, the actual objects that are the focus of preservation, such as you know, a particular game, and also what's called representation information. So this is once uh, representation information is what you need to maintain to ensure that your bit stream is intelligible and renderable over the long term. Otherwise, it's just a meaningless string of zeros and ones. So how do you decode that bit stream? So you've got to preserve the information to do that. That's your representation information. Um, in the case of, say, Mystery House, um, which, was, which ran on the Apple II system, you would want, for example, a copy of the Apple II DOS manual as part of your representation information. Um, now, this, now we get into the infinite regress because then if the, uh, if the, if the uh, DOS manual is, um, render, is, is in PDF format, then you also need to include as part of your representation information the specifications for the PDF format. And then if the uh, specifications for the PDF format reference other documents, then they need to be part of your representation network too. So this very quickly becomes this very bloated network. It's all about relationships, as Andy was saying earlier, and you're mapping those relationships within the OAIS model. Um, and I think, I mean, my understanding is that actually, theoretically or supposedly, your representation network ultimately has to end in an analog piece of information. It's actually got to you know, end with something physical in the real world. Um, I don't know if this is apocryphal. I think I've heard Jerry say this. Okay, but, oh, so actually. So another thing I want to point out here is the preservation description information in this AIP, this APE. So this includes provenance and fixity information. So now we're getting at authenticity. So the fixity information is, um, if, you know, it might include something like a checksum value, which is kind of like um, a digital uh, fingerprint. And um, so you'd run a check, you'd, you'd run a checksum program um, against your digital object, obtain your, 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 your number, and then at some later date, you'd run it, you know, you'd run the program again, and then you'd compare the two fingerprints, and assuming that there's no difference between them, you can assume that there's been no changes in your bit stream, that nothing's been tampered with, or that nothing's, there's no bit rot or whatever. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's fixity information, making sure that your bits are stable over time. But then there's provenance information, which is documentation about the life, um, the life of the, uh, the artifact, the, the history of ownership, and the changes or transformations it's undergone. So it also records that information. So does the OIS model tolerate alteration of the preservation object? Yes, it does, but. Um, so there are definitely, the, the OAS model necessitates that you're thinking of two things simultaneously, preservation and access. You want to be able to provide access to that designated user community. So you're constantly balancing the tensions between preservation and access. Um, it might be necessary, for example, to migrate um, files to a more contemporary format um, to, that, that is compatible with your software and hardware systems. Um, uh, uh, you know, changing um, or delivering it to the end user in a different format. So, so delivering it, you know, in a JPEG format instead of a TIFF format or whatever. So all of this is documented as part of the provenance information. Um, but the, the basic idea of, uh, so even though it, it allows for some, for some change in this manner, um, you could say that in the OIS model, preservation um, uh, happens in spite of, not because of, these necessary changes that have to take place. And they're kept very minimal, and you try to do the least possible um, so that you're always preserving the integrity of those underlying bits. Okay, so we've got these two contrasting models. So as I said, I think one thing we can do is, um, it's fine for the two models to coexist, I'm not judging one model over the other, and in fact, um, the, the model adopted by a lot of gamers I think is very consistent with what we saw in the late 90s and early 2000s in the field of textual criticism, where it was all about the social text, and we valued the accretions and additions created by editors and so forth. Um, in some ways, you're kind of seeing a similar type of model in the, among at least a lot of the gaming community, but not all of them. Um, but given that they uh, play such a prominent role in digital preservation, can we think about services that we might provide um, that support that model? Um, so um, this is just a quote from Jeremy John at the British Library. I mentioned him earlier, and he has this great white paper on personal digital archives. And uh, he, he has this to say, Jeremy John of the British Library has postulated that, quote, future researchers will be able to create phylogenetic networks of tr or trees 
from extant personal digital archives and to determine the likely composition of ancestral personal archives and the ancestral state of the personal digital objects themselves. So thinking about tools that we might provide that to the, these communities to kind of map um, and, and uh, visualize um, the interrelationships between the different versions of the games that emerge. So if we've got these version streams around objects, then this is something we could do. Um, you already see, do see the, the gamer community doing similar things. They create, for example, trees showing the different versions of Adventure, which is that game I mentioned earlier. It was created in 1975 by Will Crowther, um, revised, uh, the source code was released, it was revised by um, uh, Don Woods and a couple years later and the user community, the player community has continued to adapt and change it over time and they provide these kind of trees. This, this tree is actually based on um, several of those in the player community but was created um, anew by Jerry McDonough and Matt Kirschenbaum and published in Digital Humanities Quarterly a year or two ago. Um, but I want to provoke, uh, to close, I want to um, propose one other potential uh, approach to this, and this is very, it's still very unformed, um, but, and it's something I, I originally floated in our 2010 white paper um, that came out of this project, and you can actually just Google for Preserving Virtual Worlds final report. Um, and so let me just, this, is, this was inspired by my colleague in the iSchool, Jennifer Golbeck. Um, she works on, she studies trust relationships um, uh, in web-based social networks. So she actually um, designs algorithms um, to, to do this. And there's tremendous interest um, in, in, certain, in, in the uh, social network analysis world around trying to understand trust in online communities. Um, and develop, developing trust models, ways to detect trust, measure it, um, and so forth. And so Jen, I'm actually borrowing from Jen's dissertation and proposing this idea. She, she designed some algorithms um, to, to measure and detect trust and model it in some, some communities. So I'm thinking again about surrogates, surrogates or proxies for what it is we really want to try to get at. So can we get at authenticity in a different kind of way? So digital preservation services calculating trust in fan-run game repositories. Because game archives in the wild cannot usually be authenticated according to standard integrity checks, an alternative method for evaluating the authenticity of their holdings might involve the application of trust-based information. Jennifer Goldbeck, for example, has demonstrated how the trust relationships expressed in web-based social networks can be calculated and used to develop end-user services, such as film recommendations and email filtering. Applying Goldbeck's insights, archivists could leverage the trust values in online game communities as the basis for judgments about the authority or utility or authenticity of relevant user-run repositories, such as abandonware sites, home of the underdogs, and game catalogs, uh, like Moby Games. Under this scenario, authenticity is a function of community trust in the content and the um, and the other individuals who are part of the community being provided. One consequence of this approach is that authenticity and mutability need not be considered mutually exclusive terms. On the contrary, fan-run game repositories that make provisions for transformational use of game assets, such as altering the appearance of avatars or inventory items, might in many instances increase trust ratings. So very counterintuitive, and it's a very different way of getting at the issue. And I'll just leave it there. Um, 
the uh, it, it also um, bears on the, the question that you asked, you know, in, in opening as to whether we're really talking about data modeling at all. And to that, I would say, well, you, you're in a sense you're not talking about data modeling in the sense that we've talked about it so far today, because you're talking about a, a model being a protocol, a set of rules, a set right, of definitions, right. a framework. Yeah. But nevertheless, you're 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 face up against all of the problems because you have the problem of dealing with the stack, which in which we have both explicit and implicit data models in the more concrete time form all built in. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, we haven't really gotten in so far to some of the other, you know, sort of metaphysical problem questions about what's the, what's the difference slash relationship between a serialization format and the model that it's in, that it expresses, or for that matter, not even a serialization format, but an implementation of a program or an algorithm versus the model that it expresses, yeah. right? Yeah. Those are all buried yeah, in right. all of these issues right. about how is it that we actually in, Encapsulate right. This thing. So, so the data model issues are more sort of subterranean. They're subterranean, yeah. but they're but they're but they're at the heart of it, right? Because if we can't actually know what those things are, then how do we expect this thing to to, to you know have any preservation at all? I mean, even look at it, much less to run. Right. Right. Yeah. I was also thinking about um, um, Alan's talk too, in terms of like the issue of um, identity conditions, and I think you could sort of think about different communities having. Um, more more rigid or looser identity conditions in terms of how they approach the um, the similarity or the sameness between two or more objects. So it seems like you know many members of the game community adopt relatively loose identity conditions, or they operate kind of at the, to think about Ferber terms. They operate at the Ferber uh, work entity type level rather than like so. Okay, one additional point of contrast is that in OAIS. Um, as it's now implemented, uh, usually or customarily, um, there's really no such thing as like a duplicate of an object in the OIS model. So if you create a duplicate of a file, or if you migrate a file, um, but and let's let's just stick with a duplicate. You know, you've got you've got a duplicate that still has the same um, you know uh, bit stream uh, values as the original in OI, OAIS implementation. Those are considered two distinct objects. Um, the the one the second uh, the second dupe that is is um, not considered a variant of the original, um, but rather its own unique distinct object. Although you do preserve the relationship between them, which is a derivation relationship. But they're treated. There's no such you know. There's really no such thing as thing as like two objects being the same. I don't think in the OIS model. There's a very interesting book by uh, Salvatore Setsis, uh, which is called The Future of the Classic. I don't know if there's an English version, so there's an Italian and a German one. And um, that very much follows, or basically brings another example for your point, right, about the difference of preservation. And actually, so he, he says, basically, Europeans always, or the Western world, always focuses on like, depicting ruins to signify old age. Um. While Chinese and uh, Asian people in general tend to, um, to, to signify old age would say a really old tree. And ruins were actually something imported from the West. And um, if you look at preservation, a Japanese temple is still considered old even if there's no piece of wood which is older than 50 years because it's done in the same way as 500 oh, years ago. Oh, right. I've actually heard about that model of preservation where, um, uh, it, well, it's, it's, the, it's the, uh, the parable of Theseus' ship, right? Yeah, right. Isn't that what it is? Where where um, Theseus has his ship, and or is it is it Theseus? Yes, Theseus. Yeah, and yeah, and he and over time he has to keep replacing planks as they yeah. as they rot, and so at the end of the day, is you know, is the ship with completely replaced planks? Is it the same ship that he set sail with? Um, because structurally they're the same. Yeah. Um, but they, they maintain the Theseus ship in Athens. Okay. The, the shrine in Issei, every twenty years they rebuild it next to itself. It was completely new materials. Okay. It's been going on since the year 600 or so. Right. Um, and so every 20 years, it's just a different building. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the point is we, we don't need to. Uh, so, so basically, what, what we have in mind is to think about preservation as this reliquary kind of Catholic, right. Right. Catholic church kind of thing, right? Which is the rest, something which is not used anymore, which you just look at it. But if you look at other things, like the Dome of Cologne, like the Church of Cologne, which is restored all the time, right? Because if you're already in one end, you have to start at the other end because it rocks while it's <coughs> built, right? And I think 
So there, there may be examples all across the world where we can actually trace that and basically foot that somewhere, which maybe is a better argument. You know, because probably, as it looks right now, my hunch would be there's a better user base for gamers preserving games in Asia, Korea, Japan, and China than yeah. here. Is that yeah. true, or is there? Well, I, I mean, that's a good question. I actually don't know. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, I, it's an open question. I was thinking of something I would ask later, but I can do it now. I, from, from what I heard that concerning also the, the OAIIS model and the previous talk with this discussion about prices, is that we're somehow, when discussing about data modeling, we need somehow to discuss about the kind of metadata model that we need to interpret what's going on in the evolution of information. Mm -hmm. um, we are constantly in this situation, and I mean, I call that surrogate in some of my talks, but the kind of generic view that every digital object we create at some point is surrogate or something. So the application is one operation, one right. possible operation. Or creating, creating a document, compiling annotations about um, natural code, Mona Lisa, is creating kind of surrogate also for this object. And by really identifying what is specific to such a surrogate, authorship, time stamping, um, relation to possible sources yeah, in, right. in a kind of recursive way is necessary so that we we can see those phenomena of, of preservation as also taking into account those evolutionary phenomena. And we're, we're probably missing this in, in, in the community as a whole. Yeah, I think the temporal dimension is really, really interesting. I know the number of you in the story in the room, sorry, know that story. Um, but this poem that was designed to erase itself by William Gibson, um, uh, so that if you ran it in your browser once, it scrolled down your screen and then it encrypted itself and it was gone forever. And so they, the creators, including Gibson, actually had a good time uh, imagining what you know librarians would do, and they actually had to you know, create a finding aid or whatever for one of these objects. But okay, so present. So how do you? capture and preserve presence. Oh. So I, I immediately think of someone, again, like John Polito, who also works with this kind of art. Um, and I don't know, I, 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 he's created um, this new media art questionnaire, um, where, which he gives to new media artists um, uh, to fill out before their artwork is exhibited or acquired by a museum. Um, and it basically has the artist uh, go through and indicate which attributes or features are uh, absolutely necessar necessary to preserve over time and which ones are um, he or she is willing to sacrifice. So I imagine that that questionnaire probably captures some of those things, um, but I, I guess I'd have to think about like a concrete example um, in terms of some, have something like presence of play out. Yeah. Well, to add to that, um, the Agrippa project is a great example I was lucky enough to be on that project, and the, the way that I right. managed to be archived was kind of through a cheat with uh, yeah. people filming it <laughs> right at <laughs> the kitchen. Yeah. Right. It's fantastic, and we have it on the site. Um, but I was thinking about that in terms of um, the immediacy of the experience of gameplay itself. Mm -hmm. And so, how might that be archived? And is there a possible cheat? And the possible cheat might be machinima. Um, or um, something along those lines. Okay, and I that's great. Yeah. That kind of right. Okay. So, okay. So, generally, as part of an OAIS, we <laughs> also preserve context information, which is different from representation information, which is much more technical. The context information is a, a, the other information you have to include in order to help um, a user at some time in the future make sense of and understand the significance of this particular piece of work. So. In the case of um, uh, 
text, the text adventure game, Colossal Cave Adventure, be included, for example, Dennis Jers' article on the, on the game. Um, he actually uh, went and explored the cave system in Kentucky um, that, the, that, the, that the game tried to model, and then he kind of you know, mapped similarities and differences, and he traced the whole provenance and history of the game and so forth. So that, that article became part of it. So I imagine, I mean, I think you could sort of indirectly get at presence and things like that through, again, surrogate documentation. Um, there's, uh, well, there's also things like, my, my colleague Henry Lowood talks about this quite a bit, um, things like uh, game demos for certain genres of games like Doom, um, where you're not video recording gameplay, a game session, but rather there is a feature of the game engine that um, will, will capture a, um, gameplay um, through a set of uh, instructions. Um, basically, it's like, um, it's basically documenting or notating um, it, you know, the inputs of the player. And then um, you need that same version of the game engine to play back that demo. Um, but again, it's not video recording, it's actually documenting or notating or um, uh, the, the, the input or the, um, uh, the input of the player um, as a set of instructions. Word for it is transaction, capturing the transaction. Oh, okay, that's what it is. Okay, yeah, so, so something like that. And, and mankind has done it for hundreds of years with, say, chess. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, um, they, they're using traps and similar tools to capture what's on the screen, and there's a huge, a new sort of text called Let's Play, where people sitting at the front of the screen and they uh, comment themselves while they're playing. So they're not just recording mm -hmm. the game, but they're recording what they're doing then at the moment mm -hmm. and how they're feeling. And so this could be an answer. Yeah, playthroughs and walkthroughs. It's exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so it's like all of this kind of layer of what has happened in this environment. It's just oh, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting analogy to art history, right? Because art historians for a very long time, like if you think of like very famous books like the Cathedral by Sidney he basically studied them from the photographs. And that's what's going to happen with the history of video games if you go down that road. Right? Yeah. Because if never, nobody ever had a competition pro 5,000, shall I say, for eight that's hours right. to play a certain game, he does not know how it feels. That's right. Right, it makes me think too of, um, there, there was a practice in the Renaissance where Renaissance artists like Titian who try to reconstitute lost paintings of antiquity based on surviving verbal descriptions of them. Very good. <laughs> so I, I have a question about uh, your experience with the OAIS model. Mm -hmm. um, it's extraordinarily complex. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if this is an example that is instructive in a negative kind of way. Because this is a conceptual model that is so complex that implementation of it in practice is almost impossible. Uh, and I don't think that's exactly an exaggeration. A, a Portico report uh, from 2001 uh, reported on trying to implement OAIS models at Cornell uh, for digital preservation mm -hmm. and discovered that a model that they call zip and hold, where you just zip up a bunch of files and get them onto spinning disks, was actually a far more uh, reliable. <laughs> yeah. And one of the questions I have about OAIS is, that, that I think is relevant to the discussion here is when is a, is a conceptual model an impediment to getting required work done? Because in the yes. cultural heritage community in, in particular, the OAIS model is so intimidating that people are letting their per portable hard drives, CDs and DVDs pile up because they don't have a solution that will perfectly implement the OAIS model. Right. We're losing cultural heritage Cause the preservation I, yeah. data modeling. I, I absolutely so agree. No, I agree. I, wish, I actually wish Jerry McDonough were here because he, he was really um, the lead on that part of the project. But we had a very small case set, so that's why it was feasible. Um, but again, I would point in contrast to the gaming community, where they're very, I don't know what the word, I'm not, I'm, I'm reaching for a word, it's not quite opportunistic. Mm -hmm. But they'll do things like, you know, in the, in the early 90s when bandwidth was really awful. They would rip out, you know, certain certain behaviors of the game, like the sound or some of the graphics, and just upload what they were able to. Or in the case of Agrippa, again, 
Um, the player community, or, or the, not the player community in this case, the, the community interested in the work of William Gibson, science fiction and so forth, or interested in new media art, um, they, uh, they simply circulated on that the 300 line poem, a transcript of the poem in plain ASCII text, that circulated for years, a, 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 you know, a poor fragment, a poor representation of what was originally this book artifact with a three and a half inch floppy kind of sitting in the middle of it and then you plug the floppy in and so forth. So, but because they floated the 300 line plain ASCII text for years, a decade, eventually researchers were aware of it and knew of it and had encountered it. So they at that point had the resources to go in and do something more sophisticated with it. So it's almost like however, however weak that signal we can send down the conductor of history, it can be amplified by you know, a later age. There's another example that goes in the same direction. Right? If you think about like, how much time and money public institutions have spent on like, building image databases in different fields. Um, and then look at our, our store, for example, has 2 million objects. Facebook has 25 billion photographs. It's the largest image database on Earth. And if you look at people running through museums, right? If photograph photography is forbidden, they can never take metal let's take a picture and rip it up, right? Right. And show it to their friends. Right. And I think um, that's that's resources which are untapped outside of a few scientists who actually get access to the data and then they publish new papers, right? Because they can't really do the data. But I think that's that's a very, very interesting point that that you make that basically all our models and all our setups are actually not um, not encouraging documentation. Yeah. They're actually inhibiting documentation. I mean, it's that, that old you know aphorism about the perfect being the enemy of the good or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two points in, in regard to the OAIS. You might take a look at something like Archivematica, which is an open source uh, OAIS. Development. Have you seen it? Yeah. So, you know, of someone doing it from an archival point of view, and then the other would be uh, just to call attention to the Electronic Record Archive at the National Archives in the United States, which the initial development of that was in the hands of Lockheed Martin, and it was based on the OAI. And um, it, it ran into a, a wide variety of things uh, that caused problems, um, not the least of which is probably the fact that you have a large contractor, government contractor, are used to being paid large sums of money and not producing much, unfortunately. But the, uh, So I was going to say about this. Oh, the, but the, the requirements within the context of national archives and government archives, and, and this is true around the world, is that you have things that are legally mandated in terms of, of the archiving of records and maintaining them over time. And so that adds an ex extra layer in here uh, that has to be met. And of course, in a lot of cases, what's going to have to happen is you're going to have to go back and revisit the legislation and set it up to begin with. Because, for example, with, with the national uh, government in the United States, you, you had uh, transfer schedules that allowed a creating agency to keep the records for 15 years. In, in a digital environment, if that's electronic records, oh, yeah. 15 years <laughs> after the fact can make them yeah. a little difficult to... Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, it gets really, really complicated. So, on one so hand, hand yes, it's complicated, but on the other hand, it's a complicated problem. So, the two examples that you gave me, so those were, those were just flat out ones. No, 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 I would, you know, I do not want to be interpreted as saying that okay. the National Archives okay. is, 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 is <laughs> there a, a member of the advisory committee. Okay. <laughs> no, let's, let's just say, you know, it, it's met a certain set of requirements, but it didn't 
didn't realize everything that they wanted. And so, uh, you know, part of it uh, is, you know, over, over time it will have to be further developed. In the now, officially on the record, that's my position. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. We, Thank we you. Got those.